All right. It's urban legend time. Now, some of you are probably thinking, why? <laughs> why am I doing this movie? Knowing how I feel about it. And all the other post-scream slashers, or quote-unquote slashers, as I like to put the quotes around them. Spoilers also for a few 80s slashers, so skip ahead a minute or two if you don't want those spoiled for you. But something that... I always think of, and I've brought it up on the channel before, of what makes, like, the 80s specifically with slasher movies, what gives it the charm that it has so much that these ones just don't for me and for many other people I know that they also don't like Scream or they don't like all these post-Scream light slasher adaptations with pretty people on the covers, all the pretty faces, and there's no kills. It's cut away for most of the kills. And you see this in all the Scream movies. You see this in all the I Know What You Did Last Summers and Urban Legend here and its sequels and the Halloween H2O with Kevin Williamson rewrote a hell of a lot of that script. Now, this one came out in 98. Scream didn't come out until December of 96. So this was probably being written right when Scream was in post-production or I, I don't know for sure. So, if anything, this might be the least inspired by Scream, and maybe that's why it works for me the most out of all those aforementioned movies. But I can't take it seriously. It's the same issue I have with all those other movies, and Scream particularly. And for those of you who watch, I, yeah, you know I don't like Scream. I feel like I have to mention and explain it just in case, like, you know, some new person watches, and like, this person really does not like Scream. Like, I don't get it. And, like, my shit's like an episodic journey. Like, they all link together. So <laughs> go back and watch old shit. You're missing stuff. But how can I watch Happy Birthday to Me with Melissa Sue Anderson from 81 and see that ending, which is ridiculous. I know how crazy and stupid it is that the killer takes her off her, a rubber face mask of Melissa Sue Anderson, and it's the killer. It's stupid, but I love that movie to death. It, why? It has charm to it. What about it? I have no idea. And that's the question that I always ponder, is why can I take that and suspend disbelief for a movie like that? But when you have, uh, what the hell's her name? Gayheart in this is the killer, throwing people all over the place and murdering these people that are so much bigger than her. I can't, I can't. I think it's so stupid. It makes no sense. And you see what I'm saying? Like, what gives the 80s that charm, what about the charm from the 80s <laughs> allows us to believe and put stuff aside and suspend disbelief and be like, yeah, that's ridiculous, but whatever, it's awesome. Like Pieces, movies like that, and The Mutilator, and Blood Rage, and all the Fridays, and like, like all of these films with stuff that would never happen, but we still love them. But then when I look at like late 90s, early 2000s slasher films... They just don't have that, so I can't take it seriously at all, and it just learn it leads to a whole mess. So I don't know if anyone has any any ideas on that whole idea. Redundant, but anyone has any input or knows what the hell I'm talking about, let me know because it just definitely had something in the '80s with the slashers that were just whether it be nostalgia or charm or a mix of all of that that just you don't have in these films. So then I start really overanalyzing like I usually do and dissecting shit and none of it makes sense. But enough with that. We have Alicia Witt who plays the redhead, if I remember right, the main girl. She's fine. She's fine carrying the movie. Jared Leto is in here, which he's great in pretty much everything. And this is 98. This is a year or two before what I consider his best performance as uh, Harry Goldfarb in Requiem for a Dream. Um, Joshua Jackson's in here. Then we have a few horror icons here. We have Robert Englund, excuse me, who plays one of the teachers. We have Danielle Harris, who plays her horny-ass, like, <laughs> goth roommate. And pretty sure we have somebody else, too, right? And then we have um, 
a woman who I love as Loretta Devine, as a security guard, the cop. <laughs> when I, I didn't know her as Loretta Devine when I first saw this in 98, when it came out. But I saw her on the show Boston Public on Fox 5 that with, uh, what the hell, with uh, She McBride and all the other teachers and stuff in that hellhole of a school they had to work in. <laughs> she was on that. And let me tell you, Loretta Devine can act. Like, she is an She's a sublime actress to watch. Marla. No, Stephen, I want to respond to this stuck-up ice queen. Let me tell you something. Let me tell all of you something. The reason I'd had it is because I have to go into a room day after day after damn day and try to break through to a bunch of kids who don't want to listen, don't want to learn, and don't want to give me the decency of being quiet. Harry Sennett shot off a gun. I would have rolled in a big cannon if I knew where to get one. I would have tried anything. And you show me a teacher who doesn't almost lose his or her mind sometimes, and I'll show you a teacher who's not trying. But phenomenal actress. But didn't know her as Loretta Devine when I saw this. Always will know her as Loretta Devine now. And you could say, yeah, she always kind of plays her own sassy black woman self, but... So the CCH Pounders, I mean, <laughs> it don't really matter. We love them. So the whole idea here of somebody recreating all of the old urban legends that we've heard, like the woman taking care of the children, and I mean, like when a stranger calls, the exact beginning of that movie, the trying to dry their the dog in the microwave and the pop rocks and stuff. Or whether you hear the boyfriend's legs on the top of the car. There's like a whole bunch of versions of that one as it is. That's a cool concept. And it's used pretty decently here. Like, this movie isn't that low for me. Like, this is one that I can watch every so often, every few years. And a lot of it really has to do with Loretta Devine. Like, <laughs> like I know I already talked about her, but she's so funny in this. She's so great in this. I, I, she saves this movie for me. Because uh, Wit, Alicia Wit, she's fine. She's like a Nev Campbell to me. Like, she's fine. But I don't love her. I don't think she's a great leading woman. I don't think she's bad in any way. She's just there. And the score isn't bad either in this movie, if I recall. Like, just hearing the beginning score. It's nothing, like, memorable. Like, if anyone said to me, like, you know, the urban legend theme... I wouldn't be able to hum it or, like, think it in my head or anything like that. But it, it's good. It's it's nothing bad. It's a good-looking movie. The cinematography looks all right. Like, there's nothing bad, bad about this movie. It's just the, where the story goes and just decisions that are made and lines and the acting's not great. Like, <laughs> it's not. Like, there's some good acting, like, specifically from uh, Jared Leto... And all the the extras, you know, like Robert Englund, of course he kills it, and Danielle Harris, and uh, Brad Dorif, who we get in the beginning here, which is so cool to see Brad Dorif anytime, anywhere. And and before you think it, no way in hell are the sequels coming anytime soon. <laughs> just to let you know. This was just a random looked on Tubi, and the urban legend, it, it was highlighted. And I said, you know what, I'll give it another shot. So that's what this is. The whole beginning with, um, oh, I know her name, too. Not the actress, the character's name. Her Mancini is her last name. Michelle, I think her name is Michelle Mancini or something like that. Because you have Brad Dorif here in the opening. And then right afterwards, you hear this girl's name, and it's Mancini. It's like such an homage to Don Mancini in Child's Play. You got Brad Dorif right there. Cool. Like, cool homage. But the whole beginning here with Mancini driving, and she's listening to uh, Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse of the Heart, which you can all have your opinions, we always say here. I think it's one of, in the t top 20 at least, greatest compositions of all time. That song, Total Eclipse of the Heart. If you don't agree, fuck you, you're wrong. But her singing to that song at the beginning, of that, that, that I could even say is pretty iconic at this point in time. Like, most people remember the intro to this movie, even if they don't remember the rest of this movie. The intro is pretty memorable.
and she ends up pulling into the gas station that Brad Dorif works at. Uh, I mean, I'm sure he has a character name. Brad Dorif doesn't work at a gas station. I, I'm pretty sure. But his character does. And he's creepy as shit. So, like, you can't blame her for freaking out. But she ends up going inside the store with him. Uh, then he starts acting creepy. But, uh, like, in a sec. She ends up leaving. And she gets in the car, and he's screaming, no, no. And then as soon as she drives off, he screams out, there's someone in the back seat, which we've all heard the urban legend. If you get in the car, there's somebody in the back, and he kills you. He couldn't have said this, like, immediately. Like, the, instead of saying no and wait and all of that shit, <laughs> immediately he couldn't say, wait, lady, there's someone in your car. Like, you, you, you got to stay here. It's not safe. Come on, man. Like, that's what I mean. Like, things like this, and there's a lot of this in this movie. I just can't take it seriously. It's like, why? Like, all he does is scream no and wait and come back. He can't relay the information. And yes, we wouldn't have a movie in it, but you could write this better, like, and still have a movie is my point. And and my point, every time I bring up stupid shit like this (laughs) that people have, you roll your eyes at it, so JT is just overanalyzing. Yeah, but you could write this better. You could have written this so many different ways that it still made sense, and that he was still able to to warn her, but she still got in the car and drove away. Like, I don't know. (laughs) It's just, it's always going to annoy me, and there's a lot of that in here. But I love Brad Dorif, and he gives a nice little uh, cameo performance here, so all is well. Yeah, not to keep harping on this for long, but (laughs) he literally sees the person in the back seat right after he starts pumping gas. He puts the pump in, and then there's a shot deliberately of him looking in the back seat, and then he rushes into his office. So he could have told her from now... (laughs) until like three minutes from now that there's somebody in your seat and he didn't do shit so it's it's stupid but then when she drives away and she's singing again and then she ends up getting decapitated which you don't see anything that's another thing it's just the kills man like there's no kills and i i can't watch a slasher film and enjoy it fully without kills like we know she got her head chopped off because you see the short short little shot of the axe coming and then it breaks through the window and stuff. You kind of see your head go a little like this. That's it. It's not the worst. I mean, it's not a complete cut kill, but it sucks, man. Like, for an opening kill of your movie, of your slasher film, it's not good. Despite how good the opening scene is. Again, this is a movie that's scary movie, and its sequel's ruined for me. Because now all I think of when I watch this is Anna Faris driving, singing the uh, graduation song. As we go on, we remember. And then the radio sh- <laughs> says, yeah, can you shut the fuck up and let me sing? And then she stops, and then it keeps on singing. That's all I can think of now when I see the beginning of this movie. And it makes me laugh hysterically. So that doesn't help its case either. And also, I want to know, too, did anyone, the first time they saw this movie, not instantly know Rebecca Gayhart was the murderer? Like, I really need to know, because for me, it was so obvious. Like, I picked her as soon as they showed her here with all the kids. Said, it's her. (laughs) I don't know what it was. It's just the way she looks. She, She looked like she could play someone, and I've seen her before and other stuff before this. But I don't remember her. Like, I don't really remember her acting or anything but i just took one look at her i said this bitch looks crazy like this is the girl right here Uh, then as the movie goes on a lot of time in this movie she is not on screen and she she talks to like uh, the main chick on the phone or she'll stop in real quick and then she'll be like i gotta go she'll bounce and she'll be gone for another half hour it's it's so telegraphed that she's the killer for me like maybe people don't see it coming i say it all the time i i there's twists that have happened in movies that I completely didn't see coming that most people did. But I knew instantly that this bitch was a killer. So they're at Pendleton University, which um, my girl Reese, uh, Loretta Devine, says in a little bit that it's the, supposed to be the safest university in the country. Doesn't turn out that way. <laughs> but before 
the events of this movie, it seems like it was. Except for this whole massacre that supposedly happened in um, one of the buildings or whatever. There was like a whole 25 people who were massacred to death, which is a whole little urban legend here at the campus in itself. About that, we'll talk about it later because it really doesn't seem like it plays into anything. I could be wrong, but I remember her motivation, the killer. And I don't think it has anything to do with anything about this massacre at Stanley Hall. That's the name of the place. So it was the Stanley Hall Massacre. And it was 25 years ago where 25 people died. It was 25 years ago, but I forget how many people died. So Natalie is the name of the main chick, the redhead. And Brenda is Gayheart. And they go to do Bloody Mary in front of some random wall of, of one of the halls. I don't know why they're doing it there. <laughs> Is it supposed to be in a mirror? And they say it five times. And isn't Bloody Mary three times? Candyman's five times. I, none of this matters. Then you got their friend Damon, the blonde-haired dude. Forget who played. Is that Joshua Jackson? I don't even know who Joshua Jackson is. <laughs> now that I think about it, I know the name. Can't picture his face. Is he the other friend? Who cares? Then you see um, some red herring who always has to be thrown in here. After you see Damon, he's like the prankster out of like all of them. He's like known like university wide for his pranks and then she runs into this like night janitor who is the scariest creepiest looking guy that you could ever imagine the only reason he exists is to possibly be the killer and that's stupid to me again like why put him in here the only reason this guy looks so creepy and <laughs> and so weird is so that you could think maybe it's this dude and let's talk about the look of the killer here. You don't see the killer that much, if I recall correctly, which is something they do decently. Again, if I'm right. <laughs> but the whole parka look, it's all right. It's nothing great. It's nothing good. It's nothing you know, like close to good. It's nothing terrible, though. Like It, it works. It's fine. The whole scene with Robert Anglin giving the urban legend lecture and all of that, great. <laughs> Just by having Angle in there, great scene. Which, and I shouldn't even have to say this, since most of you are, you horror fans should know, just goes to show Robert Anglin can't just play Freddy Krueger. This guy could play anything. <laughs> Anglin is such a phenomenal actor. And this bitch Brenda Gayhart, she knows everybody <laughs> who suffered from or died from one of these urban legends that he's talking about. The one with the kids upstairs and the killer's come, calls are coming from inside the house happen to a friend of a friend of her. The, the pop rocks, when he calls her up and tells her to eat some, uh, then hands her a Pepsi, and she's like, no, 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 and he calls it soda for some of you. <laughs> and she says, drink it, and she's like, no, 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 no. That happened uh, to Mikey, the cereal commercial guy. Like, this girl knows, like, everybody that's been killed by an urban legend. Now, great choice here for this scene. When the when um the prankster Damon comes up, he says he'll do it, and he eats the pop rocks, he drinks the Pepsi, and then he starts pretending like he's dying and shit. Great choice to make Anglin not give a fuck at all. Like he knows he's full of shit. He knows his kid's acting out and doing a prank because he's a he's a friggin' one. He has common sense, <laughs> and two, he's the one giving the lecture. He's a friggin' professor here. He knows that you're not dying from drinking Pepsi and Pop Rocks. It's so, like you even see Damon like holding on to him, and he's just like like like, <laughs> like pulling away to let him fall to the ground. I love that. They could have very easily made Anglin start freaking out too, and then I would have been saying, "Why is this professor freaking out when he knows that nothing's going to happen to this kid?" And they didn't do that. So very good decision. Then we have Jared Leto, who, like I said, is great and everything, and he's the journalist on campus, and he just cares about his story. Like, that's all he cares about. <laughs> so they found out now that about uh, Mancini. I want to say Michelle, but who cares again at this point? The girl who was beheaded at the beginning. So he's writing a story about it, and even uh, Natalie, the main chick, it's like, you don't have a heart. Like, you're just exploiting this girl's death. And he is, and that's a whole nother subject that I'm not getting into. Michelle. Woo! That, was, that, that saved five seconds of editing. And of course, somebody gets killed. Blame Brad Dorif. Throw his face on screen. It's him. And then Danielle Harris playing Tosh, her um, 
roommate, awesome. Great job. It's Danielle Harris being Danielle Harris, but gothic, sexy Danielle Harris, in a way. <laughs> nice little cameo here. See, like here, you hear Brenda call and leave a message. She just says, hey, you seem upset. Are you all right, honey? Call me. Like, that's it. That's the last time you see Brenda, if I recall, for a, a decent amount of minutes. And that's how it is with her throughout this movie. You'll just see her in a scene real quick and then won't see her again. Or you'll get the phone call like that and then you won't hear from her or see her for a scene or two. I, they could have done better with the identity of the killer. All right, this guy Damon is such an asshole. <laughs> He tells Natalie, like, we could just go somewhere and talk. I'm a good listener. Don't let the rest of the campus find that out. Uh, then they're sitting, like, in Lover's Lane with the tree, just like in the urban legend. And he starts opening up, saying that he just lost someone close to him, his girlfriend. And then he starts fake crying. And then he's fucking full of shit. It's all just him trying to hook up with her. And she calls him out and says he's a pig. So then he goes to take a piss. And then the killer gets him. And he ends up getting hung above the car, and she f hears the scratches and stuff. And then he's saying, don't drive away. And of course, this bitch puts <laughs> to drive and drives away and ends up hanging this guy. It's an okay scene. Like I've said before, hanging deaths, unless they're done like amazingly and like very stylistic, like in... um. Argento, Suspiria in the intro, or The Omen, like, has to be a real Mario Bava's Twitch of the Death Nerve, just because that's original in the very beginning. It has to be something like that. Like, a regular hanging doesn't do anything for me. So, the kill here is whatever. The scene's decent. We have Tara Reed in here, <laughs> which the only memory of Tara Reed that is burnt into my mind growing up is her being eaten out by Kevin in American Pie and her screaming, I'm coming, and <laughs> the father's like about to open the door and he does it, he leaves. That's Tara Reed for me. I mean, that's what was prepubescent JT <laughs> watching American Pie and love Tara Reed. But she's wasted in here. She, just a, a wasted role. She plays the radio DJ host. It's cool that it's called Under the Covers, and my podcast is in the sack with JT, so I like her style here. She, just another body that we have later on when she gets killed, or almost killed. I don't remember if she dies. I'm pretty sure she does. <laughs> She's in summertime. Let's talk about how ridiculous that whole scene is, knowing that Rebecca Gayhart's a killer. She was able to get a noose around his neck. She was around to loop it over the tree. She tied it to the car. She was all of this. Rebecca Gayhart. Come on, man! It's so stupid. It just doesn't work for me. There's people that could suspend that disbelief. That's fine. And it's the same thing in Scream with me. In the last two, especially these killers, these little motherfuckers are killing all these big men and stuff. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's bullshit, and I don't buy it for a second. Of Loretta Devine so much in this movie. When she's watching the, the movie, I forget what she's watching, some like black exploitation, like action flick, and she's like holding her gun up to the screen, and she's reciting the lines and stuff, until <laughs> Natalie rushes in, and she like gets startled, puts her gun down, and she's like, girl, what happened to you? She's fantastic in this. I love her so much. So they go, and the car is gone, and she just starts. <laughs> Hard to ask Natalie, like, I want to know, what do you want, girl? Funny. Great scene. Anything with Divine in it is automatically a great scene in this film for me. All right, some more bullshit. So, <laughs> the, Natalie sits down with all the friends, right? And the guy, I f always forget his name, the one who, he's like Exposition Central. He just, like, gives out all the information. And he starts talking about the one that was just hung. And so conveniently and specifically this guy has a mannequin of himself <laughs> that he uses to scare pledges oh come on man are you serious just to explain away what happened and make her think that like maybe she's crazy there's not really a killer this guy happens to have a mannequin of himself that could explain away this whole incident just that that is so ridiculous then we get the whole scene in the library with Natalie and Tara Reed's character and she starts showing like the Kama Sutra first of all to her and saying that her boyfriend has no choice in the matter and he, they're reading it <laughs> funny but then she starts showing off like the story of the flashing your lights 
like the gangs used to do to initiate for initiations that you would have your headlights off and then the first person who flashes at you you would turn your high beams on and chase after them which we find out in a little bit plays into natalie's whole backstory because she did that she was friends with michelle mancini who gets decapitated at the beginning of this she hasn't told anybody but she was friends with her and they did this whole thing somebody died and i don't want to speak too soon because i haven't seen this in years but isn't the person who they killed the was the boyfriend of Rebecca Gayhart, and that's her whole reason for doing all this, is to get revenge because they killed her boyfriend, right? I mean, that I can't edit out if I'm wrong at the end, but I'm pretty sure that's it, which leads us into a whole thing with the massacre. Then we get Tasha's kill here, or Danielle Harris's death. Dumb as shit, man. Like, <laughs> it's a good idea, just executed terribly. Like... This woman walks in, Natalie, and again, and then, yeah, it does make sense because she's walked in on them fucking her, you know, Tosh and her boyfriend many times with heavy metal music blasting, and so she's programmed to not look. But she can't tell the difference between someone having sex and somebody being, like, fucking killed? Like, come on, man. Like, it, it, it sounds like she's being attacked. It doesn't sound like she's being fucked at all. It sounds like she's struggling against an attacker. And this is before Natalie gets in bed and puts the headphones on and distracts herself from all the noise. There's no way that a normal person is going to not take a peek, at least, to make sure that this woman isn't in trouble, which she obviously was, and then they deem it a suicide. See this? I can't with this. The whole little in blood when she finds the body the next morning, though, and it says, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Cool, but it should have had also, aren't you glad you didn't fucking use your ears or some shit, too? And again, like, this is something they do a few times in this movie, that they'll do something, and then it seems like somebody on set thought of this and thought how stupid it was, and then they throw in something right after that to try to take back how stupid it is. Like, when she's with the Dean, and he's saying, like, you heard moaning and you didn't turn the light on, and then she says, well, I've seen them, you know, having sex a bunch of times, it's not something I want to see. Yeah, nice try, but that doesn't cover the fact that it didn't sound like she was having sex, and it sounded like she was being murdered. So, like, the, the same thing with the mannequin body, that, <laughs> oh, well, maybe we, he had a mannequin that he, he used all the time, life-size of himself. Like, it doesn't take away how stupid the scene is, though. Like, I don't know. This is why I don't watch these movies. So now, Jared Leto and Natalie team up, and they're going to try to figure out exactly what the hell's going on, because Leto... I have no idea what his character's name is. He ended up contacting uh, Michelle Mancini's high school and it was found out that she went to the same high school, found out they were friends. Uh, and that's when she gives the whole story with the headlights and stuff and how Michelle accidentally killed this guy. And while Tubi's bringing me down with commercials on premature babies and shit, I understand completely how ridiculous it sounds. Making fun of this film for having a life-size mannequin... <laughs> distraction whatever idea thrown in to explain away that kill when like i mentioned at the beginning melissa sue anderson rubber fake mask <laughs> is fine i get that again it's just a me thing i i can't help it it's just something that there's a difference there <laughs> it, i don't know what it is because it seems like there's none but there is trust me. and then they break into anglin's office <laughs> <laughs> to try to find, like, information on the massacre, and then they find an axe in there, and they think that's the axe that beheaded uh, the woman at the beginning, Michelle. And uh, then they're f right in front of the dean <laughs> with Angle in there. He's saying it's a prop that he uses in his class, and how dare you even suggest that I had anything to do with that death? I mean, he's right. He had nothing to do with anything. And the whole throwing, like, suspicion on him, that don't work either. Like, never once watching this movie did I ever feel like Anglin's character was, was possibly the killer. At all. So, uh, there's not a lot of red herrings here either. It's kind of just like a, a lack of information and clues to, like, guessing who it is. But like I said, you don't really need any because Gayhart's crazy right out the gate. And then the Dean starts playing hardball and starts saying to uh, Natalie, like, I just pulled your record and found out you had a criminal endangerment charge. And she said, I 
it happened, you know, probation she got for a year. She got it after she got accepted here. He said, oh, well, lucky, because we wouldn't take you if you had a record. And he kicks uh, Leto off the uh, paper. So he's not allowed to do anything that he loves anymore. So now it's just the two of them. They got to figure this shit out, guys. So then the Dean is in the dark-ass parking garage going to his door. And Reese, Loretta Devine, is there, my girl. And she jump scares him, which, whatever, it's expected. And she starts saying that she's having trouble locating Damon, the guy who got hung with the fucking mannequin that he uses. And uh, same with, like, the other people who were dead. And he's just, just ignoring this, like, do not call the cops, don't call the police, all of this. And then she walks away for one, two, three, four, five, six seven seconds before the killer slices the dean's achilles tendon and he falls to the ground and the killer comes out and this is the first time we finally see like a full thing of the killer with the park and the hood up like i said looks all right but seven seconds she didn't hear any of this scuffle and then she turns the car on the cars moved this is what i mean and i can't and then the car comes and and crushes him over the spikes like when you're exiting or coming through the parking garage that's cool. That could have been a cool kill if we saw something. Like, you see his bo- a shot of his body, but you don't really see. But if we saw a nice little shot of him getting pushed down and the spikes coming out, that could have been a really cool kill. But there's no way that bitch didn't hear all this happened. She walked away seven seconds ago. Then we see the creepy-ass janitor again for, again, no reason at all. We haven't seen him at all <laughs> since that first time. Just to be like, hey, remember him? Like, possible. Possible suspect. <laughs> Okay, the whole scene with the dude, the exposition dude that I never remember his name, when he gets the call during his party, and he's like, oh, it's the calls are coming from upstairs bedroom, and then they say, like, wrong legend, it's the one who tries to dry their animal in the microwave, and he goes downstairs and opens the microwave, his dog is in there, and then he starts puking, and then she grabs him and, like, starts stuffing a funnel down his throat and chemicals and kills him. Best kill in the movie. Best, best kill in the movie. And again, it's not anything great, great, but just the whole thing with the dog in the microwave and him throwing up and then it looks cool the way that they shoot this scene. So good job. But again, this guy can't fight off Rebecca Gayhart. He can't push the funnel out of his mouth. He can't do any of this. Come on. Then we get Loretta Devine taking action. She's going, looking around, got a gun pulled, and then she slips into, like, a whole bunch of blood, like a lot. And she ends up calling the cops. And these fuckers say that there's a storm and that they're responding to other calls and we'll get somebody out to you when we can. Are you serious, man? I don't care what storm. I don't care what the weather is. I don't care what town they're in. There is no way that they're not sending someone immediately to this place when the security cop, I don't know if she's an actual cop or if she's just just a security, you know, rent a cop. Either way, she's calling and saying there's a pool of blood and they don't send somebody that is beyond ridiculous. That whole thing is our, we have 30 minutes left till the finale, so we can't have cops get here. Excuse. The whole uh, chase scene with Tara Reid, that's cool. That's well done. And it it is sad, man, when she's cowering in the corner and she says, I don't want to die. Then she just starts getting hacked up. You don't see anything. It's a stupid kill because of it, but it's effective. I always like hearing that. I don't like hearing it, but... (laughs) It adds something, especially if it's a kill that you're not going to see. Having the person say, like, I don't want to die, or like just something like that, that really puts you into their mind state at the time and makes you, like, feel it with them. It's effective. It's good. And then they end up meeting up with Brenda, who's been missing forever. <laughs> like, for a long while, we haven't seen her. And they end up finding... Uh, Robert Anglin Wexler's body in the car that they've been driving around in. And then they start thinking that it's uh, Leto's character. All part of Brenda's beautifully thought of plan. (laughs) And then the weird janitor shows up and is giving her a ride for no other reason, again, just to bring him back, just to say, remember him? Because then he just dies. I'm pretty sure, right? In the car crash, boom, dead. Then we get the obligatory slasher final girl must find all the bodies in one location so <laughs> finds the dean's body finds uh 
the skateboarding prank or dickhead hanging from the closet. A lot of candles, way too many. You guys know me with candles. There's no ritual going on. <laughs> There's way too many candles in this room. And then, through great shock and awe, we get the revelation that it's Brenda. That's the killer. And then we hear her whole story of why she did this. All right, and if you're waiting for me to comment on Gay Hart's performance at the end here, it's not that good. It, it's really not. She overacts like a motherfucker. There is so much overacting going on here at the end with her trying to act overboard crazy. Some lines are fine. Like it's Sometimes it's decent. Other th- times, other lines, it's just way over the top. And and just her being the killer is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it's not my movie, guys. Yeah, so his name was David, like we care. And they were getting married, him and Brenda. And then Michelle Mancini and Natalie did the whole flick your light thing, killed him. And that's why she's doing this. So what does the massacre have to do with anything? The massacre that happened 25 years ago at Stanley Hall. What does that have to do with a single thing in this movie? Other than just being a little urban legend the school has. If that's all it's meant to be, I mean, fine. But it just seems like another thing brought up that you would think would tie into something that has nothing to do with anything, and you never hear about it again. So I, I don't get any of that. But again, scene instantly saved by Loretta Devine showing up. And just, you crazy nutty bitch. <laughs> she's pointing the gun at her, and she's saying that. It's going to be all right, sugar. Like... Oh, I love Divine so much. I said, she saves this movie for me. Like, seriously. She's also, like, the only reason I can get through the sequel to this movie (laughs) is Loretta Divine. In fact, they could have just called this movie Loretta Divine Solves Mysteries, and I would have been there faster than if it was Urban Legend. And then at the end, this bitch is so crazy. I mean, yeah, I know that. But she believes Leto's character when he says when she says that she wants him and he'll have he'll have his Pulitzer and stuff. She's obsessed with this guy. Two seconds ago, she was murdering people left and right because she loved her fiance that they were going to marry that died. Now she's obsessed with him. <laughs> None of this makes sense. And Divine gets shot or stabbed, and I'm saddened by that. But she believes that this guy Leto is really going to just team up with her in the end and just give me the gun. I'll take care of the rest. And then she gets shot and supposedly killed, but then we see her alive for some reason. None of this makes sense at all at the end. Yeah, she she shows up in the back of the car when they're driving, just like in the beginning of the movie. And she has the park on still, and she's got the axe. Where'd that axe come from? I mean, who cares? And then they stop on the bridge, and she goes flying through the windshield and over the bridge and into the water. This bitch shows up again, man. Yeah, and uh, then at the end, we get a whole scene that's exactly like a scene from the beginning with exposition dude number two here at a different school ashton telling the story and stuff and then saying does anybody believe me and that this is just a school urban legend and then she's there brenda and she's like yeah, i told it wrong nobody found this woman no one's looking for her she was able to enroll in the school what under a fake name she, she where'd she get all the fake documents where'd she get 